So uh, before we get started, we should define what is heart disease. Um, so there are many forms uh, of heart disease uh, and that includes, you know, uh, valvular dysfunction that includes uh, issues with the heart muscle or the myocardium itself and also includes uh, issues with uh, conduction disease. But the most common cause of heart disease is coronary artery disease. And when we talk about coronary artery disease, we're referring to uh, plaque buildup in the arteries of the heart itself. And so with CAD or coronary artery disease, um, it's a disease process that uh, develops over time. It takes many years um, for it to accrue. And eventually what happens is that uh, your heart or the muscle of your heart doesn't get enough nutrient rich blood as a result. And so uh, when we refer to atherosclerosis, we're essentially referring to plaque buildup. And so, as I mentioned before, once you have, once you develop enough plaque, uh, the plaque can obstruct the, the, the inner part of the artery of the heart, and that restricts blood flow. And ultimately, um, that can cause the, the part of the heart that, that's blocked off to, to die or to have abnormal rhythm. And so, um, and this is usually considered a coronary or a heart artery problem. But it's not only confined to the heart. You know, atherosclerosis is a process that develop, can develop in, throughout the body and all the arteries. And so when you think of stroke, it can involve the arteries uh, supplying the brain. And when you think of having peripheral vascular disease or circulation issues, it can involve the arteries supplying uh, blood to uh, the legs. And so how do these coronary artery plaques form? And so Essentially what happens is that you have the inner lining of the, um, <clears throat> the blood vessel, uh, the inner part of it, and once it's damaged, uh, the body attempts to repair this inner lining by essentially causing platelets and uh, other uh, vascular uh, um, subfactors to come in and essentially form a scar or a scab over that area to seal it essentially. And what that does is that uh, invites um, excess plaque, or, or, or sorry, excess uh, cholesterol in, within the bloodstream, in particular LDL particles or the small uh, cholesterol particles, which then attach to this uh, scarred area. And then uh, this then re further recruits other elements in, in the uh, bloodstream as far as uh, monophages or you know, white blood cells and other inflammatory uh, cells, which then layer on top of each other until you ultimately develop this fibro fatty plaque. And so over time, this plaque buildup um, accrues and it gets, becomes larger and larger. And once the outer portion of that plaque becomes very thin and vulnerable, uh, it can be exposed. And uh, that's the issue because when it becomes exposed, the body then attacks it, uh, seeing it as a vulnerable site that needs to be repaired. And then ultimately you get an acute blockage and that can lead to Many issues down the line. And so this is a schematic here that essentially outlines what I just described. So um, you start off with the fatty streak and the inner lining of the artery. Uh, in this case, would be the artery of the heart. And over time, uh, those LDL particles or the cholesterol particles build up. They then recruit other uh, inflammatory cells that are present in the bloodstream to then build, continue to build up uh, this fiber fatty plaque. And then ultimately, when you have a very thin wall that's uh, covering this plaque, if that becomes vulnerable or if that uh, has an, an opening, the body sees it as a um, uh, disruption that needs to be clogged. And so you get this acute platelet buildup, and then that's what leads to heart attacks. And so um, this is the process that, that occurs over time and can cause uh, many acute processes as far as heart attacks, strokes, strokes and um, uh, limb ischemia or decreased blood flow to the leg. And so why do cholesterol plaques form um, to begin with? And, and ultimately it's a balance between uh, implement inflammatory markers um, in the body as well as your tendency to clot. And this is balanced against your body's ability to thin, naturally thin the blood and also to cause vasodilation or increase of blood flow to an area. And so 
this balance is disrupted whenever you have any type of processes that increase risk uh, or the amount of inflammation or blood clotting tendency in the body. And these different uh, <clears throat> circumstances include having high glucose or high insulin levels in the blood because that does increase your inflammatory markers in the body and also makes you more prothrombotic or increases your susceptibility to developing clots. High blood pressure causes high shear stress that uh, tips the balance towards inflammation and blood clotting tendency. Smoking, as you can imagine, um, uh, you have toxic substances which increase inflammation throughout the body and then tips the scales towards developing inflammation and clots. Obesity, which is associated with high cholesterol, high, high blood pressure, et cetera, that can also tip the scales in, 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 in a poor direction for, for, for patients' care and, and, and their disease processes. Inactivity, where you have increased uh, um, uh, basal dilatory properties in the body, which also tips the scale. And we can imagine with sleep deprivation, uh, you are essentially having increased stress hormones in the body, and that also tips the scales. Um, in that direction as well. And of course, infection and air pollution that, that goes along with the whole thought process of inflammation. Okay. And so why is this important? So this is important because over time, that imbalance that you have in your bloodstream can cause plaques to form. And we talked about the, the, the mechanism or the, the way plaque progresses through, through, through time in the arteries of the heart or arteries throughout the body. And ultimately, it can lead to a heart attack in the case of the arteries supplying the heart. And then for the arteries supplying the, the brain, it can lead to a stroke. And um, it is this plaque buildup that ultimately leads to heart attacks and death. And so as you can see here, this is a, a graph uh, on the y-axis, you have death. And on the x-axis, you have a year. And you can see that cardiovascular uh, mortality is on the rise for both men and women. And so this is something that we need to bring more awareness to as a result. And for women in particular, um, it is the leading cause of death in the U.S. and worldwide. And so 35% of all deaths in women worldwide are caused by cardiovascular disease. Okay, 275 women, 275 million women were diagnosed with cardiovascular disease in 2019, and 8.9 million of which died in, from cardiovascular disease in 2019. And so when it comes to cardiovascular disease in women, it is understudied, it is underrecognized, it is underdiagnosed, and it is undertreated. And while we know that heart disease is a leading cause of death for both men and women, a gender gap does exist when it comes to diagnosis and treatment. And so, for instance, women are more likely than men to die within the first year after a heart attack. And this is due to a multitude of factors. Uh, one of which is delayed diagnosis. So um, if you have uh, healthcare providers who are less likely to do upfront testing because women may present differently than men uh, when it comes to cardiovascular presentations, that's one uh, way that a diagnosis can be delayed. But the other is women themselves. If they uh, aren't aware of the different uh, ways that heart disease can present within, within women, or just uh, you know not having uh, <clears throat> not accepting the fact that they potentially could have a heart problem even though they haven't had any other issues in the past, and so that that can culminate to a delay in diagnosis and ultimately presenting later in in your stage of, of cardiovascular disease than you otherwise would have been uh, had there, there been a more of an aggressive um, uh, intervention at play. And also for women who are diagnosed with cardiovascular disease, uh, there tend to be less aggressive invasive interventions that are that are offered, um, and that this is something that we're we're seeing with more and more research with women who do develop heart attacks. Um, invasive interventions are not being offered to the same rate as uh, men, and they are being prescribed less medications. Um, so when it comes to aspirin and cholesterol medications in, in women who are admitted to the hospital for a heart attack they're not being prescribed uh, it at the same rate as men who have similar uh, cardiac presentation. And also women who, who uh, after suffering a heart attack are less likely to be referred to cardiac rehab. So as you can see, there are multiple reasons as to why there's a gender gap that does exist um, in, uh, both in, when in, men, in women compared to men. 
Um, and this is these can all explain why women ultimately are more likely to die within the first year after a heart attack compared to men. And despite the increase in awareness over the past several decades, only about a half of women recognize that heart disease is their number one killer. Um, and, and as we know, heart disease is the leading cause of death for women in the United States, and it's killed over 300,000 women in the year 2019 alone, or about one in every five deaths in women. And so what attributes to this gap is simply misinformation from commonly held myths. So myth number one, women just don't get heart disease. And we know that not to be true based off the data that I just presented to you before, because heart disease is the leading killer for women in the United States and throughout the world as well. <coughs> Myth number two, women are more at risk for breast, uterine, and ovarian cancer than they are from heart and vascular disease. We also know that to be false as well. Um, so worldwide cardiovascular disease is the single most common cause of death among women and it's nearly twice, nearly twice as many women in the U.S. die of heart attack, stroke, and other cardiovascular disease uh, as from all forms of cancer combined. So when you combine breast, uterine, ovarian, and, and all uh, and, and GI uh, malignancies in women, um, the rate of death from cardiovascular disease is more than double. Okay. Now, myth no, uh, number three: women are not at risk for a heart attack until after menopause. We know that to be false. In fact, heart disease is the third most common cause of death uh, among women aged 25 to 44. Okay, myth number four. Current research on heart disease applies equally to men and women. We know that to be false. Um, based off of recent uh, data that was collected, we know that uh, women only represent 25% of all study participants uh, based off large landmark or randomized control trials. And myth number five, men and women receive the same treatment for heart disease. And we know that to be false as well. So women are less likely to, to have an electrocardiogram done within 10 minutes of presenting with potential heart attack symptoms. And they're less likely to, to uh, be cared for by cardiologists during their admission to the hospital or just through their presentation to the emergency room. And although, although we know that uh, women have the standard risk factors that men have, including hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, obesity, smoking, and, and uh, uh, unhealthy diet, there are also um, other sex-specific risk factors that make when women or increase women's risk um, for heart disease when compared to men. And this includes premature menopause. So, uh, when you um, typically estrogen itself can be cardioprotective when it comes to developing cardiac disease. And so if you undergo premature menopause, you're not having, you're having less years of, of added protective benefit uh, compared to women who don't have uh, premature menopause. Uh, gestational diabetes is associated with cardiovascular disease uh, after pregnancy and also high blood pressure. Okay, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. So when it comes to preeclampsia, eclampsia or just gestational hypertension, all of those uh, uh, particular risk factors can increase your risk of developing uh, cardiovascular disease at a, a subsequent date later on in life. PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome, that particular disease process it increases your risk of developing heart disease, um, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and those particular risk factors, as you all know, uh, are one of the, the, the leading um, uh, causes of cardiovascular or act build up in, in throughout the arteries throughout the body um, when it comes to developing a cardiovascular cycle in the future. And then also systemic uh, inflammatory and autoimmune disorders. So when it comes to rheumatoid arthritis, when it comes to uh, lupus, when it comes to APLS, um, these particular disorders are uh, more frequently developed in women compared to men. It's about a two to one ratio. And, and remember from what I mentioned before, that it's that balance in the bloodstream of inflammatory and prothrombotic factors balanced against the blood thinning factors in the blood. And so if you're tipping the scales towards increased inflammation, um, you're going to put yourself at a higher risk of developing accelerated atherosclerosis with plaque buildup in, in the breath of arteries of the body. And in addition, there are other uh, underrecognized uh, risk factors. That are all that all fun, all fun, uh, fall under the uh, stress-related category. So, 
women, uh, uh, as you know, are, are more prone to uh, experiencing abuse and intimate partner violence, um, psychosocial factors, um, not being, not, when it comes to health literacy, not having that same access to um, uh, educational uh, opportunities throughout the world compared to men. And all of these factors, which uh, increase the stress hormones throughout the body, which ultimately uh, influence that uh, hormone, uh, the, that uh, infl inflammatory uh, balance throughout the body does increase your risk as well compared to uh, men. And the other, the other thing that I actually not listed here uh, is breast cancer. So, so we, if, you, if you have women who uh, have a higher level of developing breast cancer, not only the cancer itself with this inflammation, but the treatment for the cancer all can increase the risk. And so these are all the specific risk factors that make uh, women uh, just as likely, if not more likely than men to develop cardiovascular disease and that's under-recognized. So when we talk about coronary artery disease or CAD, we, we break it down into two main categories, okay? Stable CAD or unstable. And when we were discussing stable CAD, what we're referring to is a plaque that's pretty stable, that, that's um, causing a blockage and it's leading to symptoms, but it's reproducible in the sense that you can do the same activity and uh, cause it to occur and know that if you were to stop that activity, that it would go away or in some patients, if they have any type of emotional distress that can provoke their symptoms to, uh, to develop, but then once you remove yourself from that particular situation, then um, the symptoms uh, go away, and that's considered a stable CAD. Unstable CAD is when uh, you really can't um, de determine or anticipate when your symptoms will develop. It just happens out of the blue. It can happen at rest. It can happen when you're sleeping. It can happen when you're sitting there watching TV. And it's, some, it's something where the symptoms last for more than 15 minutes. It's not brief in duration. It's not something that you can turn on and turn off, okay? And that's important to, to know because when you fall under the unstable category, uh, it goes under the umbrella of acute coronary syndrome. And when we're talking about acute coronary syndrome, we're essentially referring to a heart attack, okay? And so it's important for you to recognize what a heart attack uh, is and what are the common symptoms when it comes to women compared to men? Now, first and foremost, the predominant symptom presentation for a heart attack in women is chest pain, okay? Women are, are, in addition to developing chest pain, they are more likely to develop additional symptoms, but the most common cause or the most common presentation for a heart attack in women is chest pain, okay? And the accompanying risks, uh, the accompanying symptoms that women tend to develop more of compared to men would be associated with shortness of breath, uh, pain in the upper back, pain in one or both arms, having nausea or lightheadedness, um, paleness or clammy skin, <coughs> excuse me, paleness or clammy skin is a symptom that both men and women do experience, and also unusual fatigue, something where it happens all of a sudden out of the blue, unprovoked, feeling extremely fatigued, um, that, that could also be another sign uh, of a heart attack, particularly women. And just to reiterate what I mentioned before, um, the most common cause uh, or the com most common presentation of a heart attack in women will be chest pain, but it's gonna be discomfort that it's gonna be associated with other symptoms as well. It's so upper body back pain in between the scapula, pain to the neck, pain to the jaw, um, nausea, shortness of breath, having that cold sweat, those are all signs and symptoms of potential uh, heart attack that's, that's developing. And so minutes matter. When this is happening, um, you know, time is myocardium. And I mean, when you say myocardium, that's the, the muscle part. And so you want to be able to, we talked about the warning signs, you want to be able to recognize them because if you're developing these symptoms, they're happening all out of the blue, never happened before, you want to call 911 immediately. Okay, because time is myocardium. The, the faster you act, the more uh, um, timely of an intervention you'll be able to, to receive. And so uh, you don't want to drive to yourself to the hospital, you just want to call 911 because 
it is not safe to be able to, to, to drive and potentially have worsening of symptoms or you know, having abnormal rhythms or passing out or, or, or all the above. Excuse me. And uh, don't be embarrassed. So uncertainty is normal. Uh, it's better to be safe than be sorry. And so if you go to the emergency room and you do the full workup and they don't find anything, that is a better scenario than delaying your treatment, showing up 15, 20, 30, and then uh, an hour, two hours later, having uh, um, a delay in your care and then ultimately having more myocardium being at a vulnerable at risk or potentially infected that otherwise would have been able to be avoided had you come in early. Okay. And so what we're essentially um, concerned about in this particular scenario would be an acute heart attack. And so we were talking about the different plaque buildups. And so here's a schematic showing the, an acute blockage. And so when you're essentially not getting any blood flow to the heart, you're going to develop symptoms that, that are, are hinting at that. So you want to prevent uh, prolonged decrease in blood flow to the heart that ultimately can lead to a dead, dead heart muscle result. And so when you arrive to the hospital, uh, they will complete standard set of testing uh, depending on your presentation. So first thing you'll do is check your blood pressure, get an electrocardiogram, so that'll, that'll really let us know exactly uh, what, the, what the status of, of your heart vessels are based off this electrocardiogram. It also, it also check your troponin test. It's, it's a blood test that it's for an enzyme that's released from the heart and out of the heart and then you have the rest. And then, uh, based off of what they find, based off your presentation and your exam, they'll determine what the next steps are. So uh, it's either you know further testing and you're on, you're on your way home, or they might decide to do further uh, evaluation when it comes to either functional or um, anatomic evaluation. So when it comes to the functional evaluation, if there's if your uh, primary doctor or a cardiology consultant decides that you would be best um, for the evaluating with the stress test, then you would do an inpatient uh, stress, nuclear stress test. And then the other is if they want more of an anatomic uh, delineation, then they would either do a CAT scan of the chest or, or invasive angiograph, which really depends on how you present and what you look at yourself. And while all the aforementioned tests are meant to identify a blockage within the artery of the heart, um, there are many women who develop, uh, who have other forms of, cor of coronary artery disease that doesn't necessarily um, cause uh, blockage in the artery of the heart. And you can develop cardiac symptoms in the absence of plaque buildup. And so the two main forms that are more common in women compared to men are what's called coronary artery spasm and microvascular coronary artery. And so if you look at the schematic up top, this is the blood vessel of the heart. And so if there was a blockage, you would see the plaque build up here, you do the angiogram, find it, and then you would fix it if it's, it's amenable to a fixed extent. However, you can have what's called coronary artery vasospasm, where the artery itself or the in, inside lining of the heart is wide open. There's no plaque build up, there's no blockage. However, if the artery spasm closes down on its own, it can obstruct blood flow. And so if you can think of anything that spasms, um, then you're temporarily causing decreased blood flow uh, to, to the heart, even though there physically is no um, plaque buildup or plaque blockage that, that's causing it. Okay? And <clears throat> another form of cardiac, uh, or another disease that can cause cardiac discomfort without any evidence of any uh, blockage in the artery of the heart is what's called coronary microvascular disease, coronary uh, microvascular dysfunction. And so you can have wide open arteries that don't feel any signs of any blockage. But remember, your arteries break down to smaller arteries and to arterioles. And so here are these small arteries that you can't really uh, visualize based off of current uh, testing methods. Those small arteries can, can be dysfunctional to the point where they're not providing blood flow to the heart. Uh, and so if you're, if you're having blockages in these tiny arteries, there's no definitive treatment that you can have. You can't have a stent for the spare because it's just too small, but um, it can lead to the same discomfort that you would have if you were to have a major blockage in the main artery of the heart. And so that's, in these particular disease sets can present in women who have a coronary catheterization and they don't find anything. It's 
why it's important to really uh, hone in on the presentation and realize that women are, are compared to men are more likely to develop coronary artery spasm on microvascular disease and to do further testing if there is a clinical suspicion to do so. And so the special testing that you would do uh, for microvascular disease in particular would be what's called a PET nuclear stress test. And that's a stress test that looks that uh, not only um, as a nuclear stress test looks at relatively relative differences in uh, flow of the artery of the heart, but it looks at absolute, it measures the absolute um, uh, blood flow throughout the, the heart at rest and with stress. And so uh, actually at for heart group, we have to have uh, a pet nuclear stress test. It's one of the only ones in, in the region as far as practices are concerned. And it's very helpful because um, we have patients who do catheterizations, we don't find any major blockages, uh, but they're, they're having angina or chest pain like symptoms that suggests it's cardiac in, in nature. And the pet stress is very helpful because it can rule in or rule out potential for a microvascular disease. Now, there are other special tests that, that are performed as well. There's the stress cardiac MRI, which are done at uh, large academic institutions, which is a, another option to evaluate for microvascular disease. And then when it comes to that coronary vasospasm that I mentioned before, you can do what's called a provocative angiogram. Now, this is a test that uh, is not done routinely. It's done at uh, certain centers that have a lot of experience. Uh, but that's one potential way to diagnose um, like microvascular spasm or, or macrovascular spasm, essentially. And so we've identified the uh, different ways that women can present with heart disease and how it's diagnosed. Uh, but now let's transition to strategies to mitigate or even prevent it in the first place. And so this diagram um, shows life simple seven. And so these are seven simple strategies to mitigate or to prevent um, heart disease from developing in the first place. And so you can see here, um, and, uh, normalizing your, your blood sugar. So if you're pre-diabetic, you know, undergoing diet and exercise regimen to try to get to the pre-diabetic range to reduce that, that risk of developing subsequent cardiovascular disease. Eating healthy, uh, as you'd expect, maintaining a healthy weight, uh, being active, uh, stopping smoking if you do smoke, um, and just so everyone's aware, uh, even a few cigarettes a day um, will more than double your risk of developing cardiovascular uh, disease in the future compared to those who don't smoke at all. So it's never too late um, to, to, to quit. And normalizing your blood pressure. So that's uh, it's blood pressure, like I mentioned before, alters that uh, uh, the, the balance when it comes to the procoagulant factors and inflammatory markers in the blood, and that can accelerate or increase your risk of uh, developing cardiovascular disease in the future. And lowering blood pressure by 12 millimeters of mercury or 12 points uh, for 10 years can save one life out of, out of 11 patients. And so it's something that definitely needs to be emphasized. Lowering cholesterol, as, as you'd expect, though, you know, I showed you the, the schematic for how plaques are about to develop in the first place. With cholesterol playing an essential role. So these are the, the, the life simple seven uh, ways that you can, um, from a lifestyle perspective, really uh, improve uh, or reduce your risk of uh, developing uh, heart disease in the future. And so, as far as the risk factors from that life simple seven that you can control yourself, uh, maintaining a healthy diet is one. Um, decreasing your risk of diabetes, reducing high blood, reducing high blood pressure is another potential way you can, uh, uh, is another risk factor that you can control yourself as well. With the caveat being that there, yes, there are um, metabolic disorders that uh, do increase uh, or cause diabetes, obesity, and high blood pressure to develop. But by and large, a lot of it can be mitigated or reversed with lifestyle modification alone. Lack of exercise. Uh, is something that, that can is a risk factor you can control, and then stop from smoking. So these are all connected and they're largely controlled by lifestyle modifications. It's something uh, that we have in our hands in our toolbook, and it does wonder. As far as risk factors that are beyond your control, age. So as, as you get older, cholesterol levels tend to increase, plaque will, will ultimately start to form. Um, and this, depending on how many other comorbidities you have, um, that can complicate things. 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that you are destined to develop coronary artery disease. It's just an additional risk factor that you can't necessarily control. Bender. So, <coughs> as I mentioned before, with, with estrogen, it's more of a cardioprotective um, hormone. And so, before menopause, you know, women tend to have lower cholesterol and also lower risk as a result of, of, of that uh, to develop coronary artery disease. But after menopause, that risk can start to level up. And then family history, you can't hide from genetics. And so having a history of uh, heart disease that develops at a young age, having high cholesterol, having a history, uh, family history of high, cholesterol, uh, high blood pressure, those are things that you can't run away from, but you can mitigate it to the best of your ability. And we talked about the cholesterol as uh, one of the simple seven categories that we can control or at least uh, try to control. <clears throat> and so I just want to touch base on the different types of cholesterol. So you have total cholesterol, which is the sum of all the cholesterol combined. And when it's elevated, it raises your risk of developing uh, atherosclerosis. Okay. HDL, uh, it's, it's the high density of the protein is one of the components of uh, cholesterol. And it's like the idea with HDL is that it maps up unused cholesterol in the blood. It may lower risk, but we're finding new evidence that this might necessarily not be the case uh, if you have a higher HDL level. So this shouldn't be reassuring, and we need to make sure that the other components are being controlled as well. LDL or the bad cholesterol or the low density cholesterol, that's the one that's involved in the pathogenesis of plaque buildup. And the higher the level, generally, the higher the risk of developing uh, subsequent uh, cardiovascular disease. And the VLDL, a very low density lipoprotein, falls in the same class as LDL. And the higher the, the level, the higher the risk. And as far as specific cutoffs, so for total cholesterol, you want it to be less than 200. For HDL, uh, for women, you want it to be more than 55. For men, more than 45. The bad cholesterol, LDL, you want that level to be less than 100. Um, and these are the, the targets when it comes to cholesterol itself. Now, going back to the simple seven, uh, what are the strategies to eat healthy? And so healthy food techniques uh, include choosing lean meats and, and poultry. So removing the removing, removing fat when you can, grilling, baking, and broiling meats, poultry, as opposed to frying. Um, and you want to select non-fat or low-fat dairy products. And so choosing skin, choosing low-fat or 1%, uh, low-fat or, or non-fat yogurt and cheese, and living dairy products to, to the best of your ability. And then, you know, when you're, when you're making salads, Try not to uh, dress it up uh, with too much dressing because then you start uh, negating the benefits that, that you were striving to achieve. Okay, and then try to use spices instead of butter and salt. Now, as far as cholesterol in particular, you want to limit total cholesterol intake as well as saturated fats. So, with saturated, <coughs> with saturated fats. At room temperature, it becomes solid form, and that's what the, the contributes to plaque buildup and throughout the uh, arteries across the body. Um, but then when it comes to polyunsaturated fats or unsaturated fats, uh, it is liquid form at room temperature, and so it is less likely to develop uh, or contribute to plaque buildup. And so that's why we want to be able to limit uh, the unsaturated fat intake. And so for total cholesterol itself, about 300 milligrams a day. And, you know, I always get asked how many eggs can I eat? And generally, around six eggs a week is considered okay. Uh, try not to do more than that. Um, and then with fats, you want it to be about 10%, uh, or especially with saturated fats, less than 10% of total calories. And a high percentage of saturated fats are going to be coming from animal fats and from dairy products. That's why we always uh, recommend uh, limiting. Uh, uh, red meats and dairy products for our patients. I'm sure it's all, everyone has heard in the past, trans fats are the bad fats. And these are the fats that come with the food that, that tastes really good. So when it comes to cookies, crackers, snack cakes, et cetera, uh, they're chock full of trans fats. And these are just hydrogenated or, part, or partially hydrogenated uh, fats. And, 
they're bad for you because they increase the bad cholesterol, the LDL, they lower the good cholesterol, the HDL, and they increase triglycerides. And you want to be able to uh, look at the labels pretty closely because if it mentions that there's food containing less than 0 0.5 grams of trans fat per serving, they can label it as trans fat free. So just because it says trans fat free doesn't necessarily mean it's completely free of fat. So, and you know, for one or two meals here or there, it might not be an issue, but if you're continually eating lots of food that has traces amount of trans fat, it does add up. And then I mentioned before the difference between saturated and uh, unsaturated fats. It's basically one is more solid form at room temperature and the other is um, liquid form. And so the healthy fats will be the unsaturated fat default because they're more liquid form. And so there are uh, within that liquid form are the unsaturated fats are the polyunsaturated and the monounsaturated. And so for polyunsaturated, they're great because they help lower the LDL or the bad cholesterol. Um, and in sample foods that contain that would be sunflower, safflower, uh, soybean and sesame oils, nuts and seeds, and fish uh, give you lots of amounts of uh, polyunsaturated fats. As far as monounsaturated fats are concerned, it does lower total and uh, bad cholesterol may increase your HDL. And so that's why you have um, a lot of uh, infomercials uh, really for promoting olive oil. So actually we're in olive oil to large amounts of mono, mono saturated fat. And that's what avocados do as well. <coughs> and for any patients who are on Basipa, Basipa contains a uh, highly concentrated form of EPA or omega-3. Uh, fatty acids. And these are forms of polyunsaturated fats that are very beneficial when it comes to decreasing your triglycerides and lowering the inflammation in your body. And there's been a trial that has been performed uh, within the past six to seven years that has shown benefit in patients who have cardiovascular disease or cardiovascular risk um, and who are on uh, the CEPA or have been taking the CEPA. And so this is why we always recommend uh, seafood and increasing seafood intake when it comes to the, the Mediterranean diet that, that's been recommended. This includes fish in your diet two or three times a week. And fish is great because it's low in saturated fats and it's a good source of polyunsaturated fats. And from that simple seven uh, diagram that I, that I showed before, the categories are reducing uh, carbohydrate intake. And not only just carbohydrates, but simple carbohydrates. So anything that causes a, a spike or a rush in uh, um, glucose in your body, which causes a rise in insulin, because those two um, products uh, tip the balance towards inflammation in your body. And so having excess sugar in the body simply gets stored as fat. And so you can think of any sugars, sweets, fruit juice, or even dried fruits, uh, I think that as well. And then when it comes to alcohol, alcohol in moderation. And that's because excess amounts of alcohol can increase your triglyceride levels and it's simply high in sugars. So as we discussed before, uh, increasing simple sugars will essentially uh, get stored as fat and will raise the glucose levels and the insulin levels in your body. So one way to combat this is fiber. So eating lots of non-starchy whole vegetables and whole fruit are great because they have lots of soluble fiber. And the benefits of soluble fiber include lowering the total and specifically the LDL or the bad cholesterol in the body. And insoluble fiber uh, is great because it adds bulk to the gut. So you're not absorbing as much of what you eat. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that uh, anytime you see any time you see the word instant, that is going to be a processed whole grain. And so you're not going to get as many benefits as which otherwise you would from something uh, that's whole in, in nature. And so if you get whole oats, beans, lentils, peas, these are great sources of uh, soluble fiber. And then exercise, real exercise. So start off 10 to 15 minutes a day and you wanna gradually increase 30 to 60 minutes a day, five days a week. And you can, you can do it in intervals. Uh, what I will say about exercise is that something is better than nothing. Okay, there, there have been studies that comparing patients who are completely sedentary to those who do just a little bit of exercise. And there are significant benefits uh, from those who uh, even do a small amount of exercise. So it shouldn't be thought of as an all or nothing phenomenon where if you're not 
you know, doing you know half mile runs and doing forty minute uh, exercise uh, intervals each and every day, then you shouldn't be doing anything at all. So something is better than nothing. Okay, and also do not forget a weight bearing exercise because this is just as important as doing aerobics. Okay, it's great for bone strength as well as as well as uh, stretching uh, for flexibility. Then weight loss. So we know that excess weight can causes uh, high cholesterol and high triglycerides, also high blood pressure and increases risk for diabetes, and it tips the scale towards the pro-inflammatory state. Okay, and same thing, it's not an all or, all or nothing phenomenon. You know, just losing five to ten pounds can can give you significant cardiovascular benefits. So um, something is better than nothing, and I wouldn't take it as, as an all or nothing uh, phenomenon. And just doing a little bit each day, it's even you know, five minutes of uh, exercise that you otherwise wouldn't do. If it's taking out instead of having, if you can drink a lot of uh, Diet Coke or Coke, and instead of having two, you have one, that, that can have significant impact on your health. So uh, baby steps are, are better than no steps at all. And so we've touched upon the lifestyle modifications that can be implemented. Uh, but sometimes that's not enough, and some patients uh, will need to take a cholesterol a medication even uh, with them uh, maximizing or, or achieving uh, uh, their uh, lifestyle intervention goals. And so who should take cholesterol drugs? People who've already had a heart attack or a stroke. But once you've already developed an event at that point, the cat's out the bag, need to be on a cholesterol medication because it won't you know, reduce the risk of developing further issues going forward. And that also applies to the aspirin. So I always get that question from patients. I get the, the study that, that recently came out, or at least recently in the news, saying that you don't need to be on aspirin. Well, that doesn't apply to patients who already have developed an, an event to begin with. So they're in a completely separate category. Uh, the, 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 uh, the times are that they're just on the aspirin are for patients who've never developed disease in the first place. Okay, so those who are LDL or uh, low density lipid protein or 190 or higher, that puts them at a significantly elevated risk. So if your cholesterol is that high, you have to be on a cholesterol medication to increase your chance of developing cardiovascular disease in the future. Okay, if you're a diabetic over the age of 40 and your LDL is above 70, where you do derive a benefit from being on a cholesterol medication. And then in general, there are risk profile scores. That are, that are out there based off of your um, risk factors. And if you have an elevated 10 year uh, cardiovascular risk, uh, you would also benefit from a cholesterol medication as well. And so the commonly prescribed medications uh, are statins and, and PCSK9 inhibitors. So statins are the, the drugs that uh, will most commonly be prescribed. PCSK9 inhibitors, they're an injectable form that helps remove that bad cholesterol or the LDL easier. That's uh, something that's usually prescribed by cardiovascular specialists. Like when you have a cardiologist, and if you're even on the a, a statin medication, you're still not at your goal. That's something that will be prescribed, or it will be prescribed as an alternative if you have side effects of the statin. And then these other forms of cholesterol uh, or medications that, that reduce cholesterol are provided here, but the two most common forms will be statins and PCSK9 inhibitors. And as in <clears throat> And as with any medication that's prescribed, it's a discussion between you and your doctor um, when it comes to potential side effects and weighing those side effects to your potential health benefits for your particular situation. That's just a discussion between you and your physician. And so uh, as a take home, you know, cardiovascular mortality is on the rise for both men and women. Um, but in particular, in particular for women, I think there is a not as much emphasis on how prevalent it is. It is the number one killer in, in women. And as I mentioned before, when you combine all cardiovascular disease, stroke, uh, heart attack, and cardiovascular disease, it is more than double uh, uh, in number uh, when compared to all cancer in, 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 women, in women in spine. So breast, uterine, GI, et cetera. So it's something that we definitely need to get the word out on and uh, it is under-recognized, it is under-diagnosed, it is under-treated. And so because of that, you know, women are, are being diagnosed in later stages than they ordinarily would have had, we had a higher index of suspicion. So it's important to know what the uh, particular signs of, of, of heart 
uh, disease are in women in particular, and acting upon that early on. Okay, and then focusing on the simple seven, you, know, you can do your part to to mitigate the risk or help prevent uh, any of these uh, disease processes from occurring. And so, why me? Why now? Well, as I mentioned before, um, even in, in younger women, uh, less than the age of forty-four, heart disease is the third uh, common cause of death. And so, it starts early on. And so, you want to start with the simple seven early on to help mitigate that. And the risk does increase after menopause because the estrogen levels start to drop. And so, you always want to keep this in the back of your mind and be proactive in order to uh, catch something, just catch something early on if there's something else. And it begins today, one step at a time. You don't have to make, uh, you don't have to go from zero to 60. It's, it's just uh, taking it day by day and doing what you can to ultimately let something be a lifestyle change. You don't want it to be something temporary, okay? Stopping smoking, being active, and adding spring training. Those are all the things that don't get emphasized as much, but should be. And these are the resources, uh, helpful articles for heart health um, education. So if you go to hmh4u.org, you'll be able to find all the particular resources when it comes to cardiovascular health. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagusi. This was great. Um, we do have a couple of questions that came in during the presentation. Sure. So um, I'll start off with what causes the heart arteries uh, plaque buildup. Is it specific foods that you eat? So it's a combination of things. It's, it's a combination of your genetic makeup and also the circumstances that you place your genetic makeup. So it's what causes plaque to develop is um, inflammation plus um, cholesterol elevation in your body and how your body processes that cholesterol. And that combined with the different inflammatory part, you know, markers, which can be raised for a multitude of reasons, from having an autoimmune disorder, smoking, having high blood pressure, having diabetes, or just having high uh, circulating hormone levels just as a genetic cause. All those factors combined when to, can ultimately lead to plaque to start to develop, and also not only for it to develop, but for it to progress and, and build. So it's not any one particular thing, but it's a combination of, of uh, markers that increase inflammation and also cholesterol and how your body processes that all together. Thank you. Um, the next question is, I have uncontrolled diabetes for years. What are my chances of having a heart attack or stroke? Um, it depends on what type of diabetes, whether or not it's type one or type two and when, when it developed and how many years you've had, you mentioned for years, but it's about five, 10, 20. And being a diabetic, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are ultimately um, um, going to develop cardiovascular disease. It just increases your risk. And um, it's never too late. Uh, if you haven't seen a cardiologist and you've had a diabetes and stroke for years, you definitely want to see one to be screened. Okay, so you want to make sure that the circulation in your legs, that the, the blood flow into the arteries of your heart, are um, are optimized as possible, and also that your cholesterol is where it needs to be. So uh, to answer your question, there are a lot of things that contribute to that. It depends on your other comorbidities. It also depends on um, you know, lifestyle factors, if you smoke, uh, how high your cholesterol is, how high your blood pressure is, all those things uh, can increase it. But it doesn't necessarily mean you're ultimately uh, going to develop it, but it does increase your risk. It's just hard to say without having the, the, the full clinical picture at hand. Thank you. Um, what are good oils to cook in? Is canola oil good? Uh, canola, canola oil, you know, when it comes to the medium chain fatty acid, uh, oils, there's mixed uh, information, uh, mixed data as far as it potentially being beneficial versus it being neutral to potentially harmful. We know that extra virgin olive oil for sure is uh, something that uh, is beneficial. Vegetable oil is something to be avoided. Canola oil uh, remains to be seen. Uh, if there are mixed uh, information and mixed data that's been published on that. Okay. 
Um, are there any recent studies or data that shows the effects of COVID on the heart? So uh, COVID, when COVID first came out, there was a concern for myocarditis. And so there is an, a small increased risk of developing myocarditis as a result, um, but COVID can be associated with abnormal rhythms. Uh, during an acute COVID phase, you're in proton products, so you're in office with increased inflammation, so you're at a higher risk of developing heart attacks and, and strokes. Um, but uh, the, the data keeps uh, changing, and so it's not as high as the risk as we thought of as it was when it first came out, but the risk is still there, for sure. Thank you. And then I have um, three more questions that are all combined into one. What is the calcium scoring test, and who should have this test? Yeah, great question, sir. Calcium score, it's a CAT scan of the chest that does not use contrast takes about 30 seconds to do. And you're essentially looking for calcified plaque buildup in the arteries of the heart. And so if you have calcified plaque buildup, it depends on how much, what the absolute number is, but also what your percentile is. It's mass based off of your gender and your age. And uh, that helps this further to stratify patients who otherwise are on the fence of determining whether or not they would need to be on cholesterol medication. So per the guidelines, if you have a risk factor score around 7.5% where that's on the borderline is potentially suggesting that you need to be on a cholesterol medication, having a coronary calcium score in that case will serve a tiebreaker depending on your age and also your absolute score and your um, percentile based off your, your uh, background. And so that's when the coronary calcium score will be helpful. And as, as far as who is beneficial for it, it's, it, it's individualized. I, I think per the guidelines, we know it's for patients who are at borderline risk where you're, you're not sure whether or not they would benefit from a cholesterol medication, but it also depends on your particular clinical scenario. So, um, you know, for instance, if, there, if you have a patient who um, doesn't want to be on a cholesterol medication at all, even though we know that they're a high risk or would potentially benefit and having that knowledge, having that coronary calcium score and saying, yes, look, you happen to have a score of 140 and you're in the 80th percentile for your age and gender, and you would benefit from it. I think that, that having that knowledge is, is powerful and it's, it's something that uh, helps uh, reinforce um, the potential benefits that patients would gain from cholesterol medication. Thank you. And actually, this is also about calcium scoring. Um, and I'm going to read them both at the same time. So how is it performed? Do you give a pill to adjust the heart rate during the test? And are there risks to the test? So uh, yeah, the, the, the coronary calcium score is different from the coronary CTA. The coronary CTA is um, a CAT scan of the chest where you do get um, contrast. Through, the, through an IV, and your heart rate has to be at a certain number so that it's slow enough to be able for us to give you a very clear picture to answer the question. When it comes to the coronary calcium score test alone, where you're not using contrast, it is simply a CAT scan of the chest, and it's only looking at a small portion of, of the, the chest wall and basically confined to the heart itself because you only want to see if there's calcium or plaque calcified plaque buildup in the arteries of the heart. So it's a low amount of radiation, so low risk, because you're only um, exposing yourself to radiation within the heart region itself. And there's no contrast uh, uh, that's being uh, administered because you're not doing a coronary CTA. You're essentially just doing uh, a simple uh, CAT scan, only focused on the heart and uh, only looking for a calcified plaque from it. And you're not looking at the RV itself <laughs> when it comes to contrast, so very quick low risk, and there's no need for uh, medication to slow the heart rate. 